So when you're working in the U.S. during the winter months, uh, if you're working in the ED or you're working with children, you are invariably going to see lots of kids with croup. And these kids tend to be uh, two, three, four years old. My little sister used to get croup all the time uh, when she was little. I, I didn't for one reason or another. Uh, but uh, I guess, you know what, probably because she went to daycare and I didn't. But that's a whole other issue. So we're going to talk about croup here. Again, I just want to preface this, that this is very common, so you want to be very well aware of how this presents the classical presentation as well as possibly some of the other things um, that may show up that can throw you for a loop. All right, so this kind of goes with our broader talk on upper airway diseases in children. These are all acquired upper airway diseases, um, and these are the ones I thought were most important for the test. Certainly there are other upper airway diseases. Uh, there's more than six. Uh, so I don't want you to think that this is all there are. However, for the test, I would say that these upper airway diseases for children are going to be the most important. And we'll talk about other things like laryngomalacia, tracheomalacia. We'll talk about that elsewhere. Okay, so we're talking about croup here, and with croup, the number one most common pathogen is the parainfluenza virus. So in common with laryngitis, it is a viral cause. Uh, however, compared to something a little bit more severe like epiglottitis, uh, which can also present with strider, which is the characteristic feature of croup, uh, this is not caused from a bacteria, this is caused from a virus. So croup affects the uh, can affect anywhere uh, from the uh, from the larynx through the vocal cords um, down through the trachea and possibly even into the bronchi. So it can affect this entire respiratory tract. Now the degree to which it actually affects the respiratory tract tract it's going to vary based on patient, but croup will at least affect the upper trachea um, and through the glottis and usually into the uh, into the larynx. Okay. So croup is also known as laryngotracheobronchitis, but it may or may not extend to the bronchi. So you may hear this referred to as laryngotracheitis, laryngotracheobronchitis, or just croup. Uh, croup makes up about 15% of pediatric upper respiratory tract uh, emergency visits, and the peak incidence is about six months to three years of age, but you can certainly have the before and after that range. In young infants, if this happens in very young infants, this can be a life-threatening emergency. Why? In children, generally, the six months to three years of age when it typically happens, croup is not something that's going to really cause you to go into respiratory distress because it just doesn't obstruct that much of the lumen. However, in babies, they have a much smaller lumen, a much smaller trachea, much smaller larynx. Um, and so because of that, any kind of infection in that area is going to drastically increase the resistance, and so that can lead to respiratory distress. There's a slight male preponderance of croup, it's about 1.4 to 1, so not really that significant, but it is there. The causes are the parainfluenza viruses, they make up 80%. Um, some of the other causes are pretty similar to what you would see as other causes of laryngitis, so adenoviruses, RSV, um, some other viruses include enterovirus, coronavirus, echovirus, uh, influenza viruses, and then much more rare uh, in the U.S. are going to be the measles virus, HSV, varicella, and mycoplasma pneumonia. I have never seen that before. So what you should know for the test is that parainfluenza virus is the chief culprit of croup in the U.S., 80% of cases. The characteristic presentation of croup is hoarseness, like we saw with laryngitis. But it also has something that we don't see in laryngitis, and what this has to do with is the fact that the trachea is affected as well. And so it causes this very distinct seal-like barking cough, uh, and then also is going to cause an inspiratory strider. And we don't see that strider in laryngitis. So two things that are really differentiating this from, uh, from laryngitis is that seal-like barking cough and the inspiratory strider. Now strider can be a lot of things. There's a huge differential for strider. Uh, but uh, when you have a child with hoarseness and then this uh, barking cough spells at night, inspiratory strider, and these symptoms do tend to be worse at night, uh, that looks like croup. The history is a sudden onset of these symptoms, and that is going to vary from laryngitis, whereas with laryngitis, the hoarseness came on after a viral prodrome. Usually there was an upper respiratory tract infection that preceded the laryngitis. So you have a sudden onset of hoarseness and then the seal-like barking cough. 
Symptoms are going to be everything we mentioned above, and you can also have some nonspecific symptoms such as low-grade fever, which we typically would not see in laryngitis. Uh, the strider is inspiratory, but can also be biphasic, since we sometimes do have uh, involvement of the upper trachea. And then uh, also there can be variable levels of respiratory distress. Usually the younger the patient is, the more likely they are to have respiratory distress. The older they are, they tend to do a little bit better in that regard. Physical exam. So you want to cl first close, closely pay any attention to any signs of respiratory distress. So anytime a child comes in and they appear ill uh, and it's something upper respiratory tract, definitely have them on a pulse ox monitor so you're monitoring their saturation. So it's the best thing you can do for any patient that comes in. Of course, if they're in significant respiratory distress for whatever reason, then you want to go ahead and establish a mechanical airway. Uh, but if there are any signs of respiratory distress, such as cyanosis, which would be severe respiratory distress, usage of the accessory muscles of respiration, if there's nasal flaring, lethargy, and certainly if there's respiratory arrest, then you're going to intubate the patient. So this is something that you need to pay attention to immediately anytime you have some kind of upper respiratory issue in a child. And usually it's pretty apparent, but you still have to do the physical exam and look for that. So for diagnosis, uh, it can be done clinically, provided that the patient is stable. However, with croup, there are some other things that can masquerade as croup. And so a basic workup can be useful to rule out any other possible diagnosis. So the immediate management for croup, like I said, you're going to want to monitor the pulse ox, monitor the heart rate, monitor the respiratory rate, and then give supplemental oxygen as needed. The workup, you're going to get a CBC and then uh, AP and lateral neck radiographs. So the AP radiograph is going to help you see this thing called the steeple sign. And the steeple sign is almost pathognomonic for croup. There's one other thing that gives you the steeple sign in the trachea. Um, that's not croup, it's actually bacterial tracheitis. Uh, but with the history of croup and then you get the steeple sign, that's a virtual confirmed diagnosis. Uh, you also want to get a lateral neck radiograph. Uh, and that's just, in my opinion, should be done for completion's sake because there are other things that can, uh, that can mimic uh, croup. And those things include uh, peritonsillar, parapharyngeal abscesses, epiglottitis. And so while you're getting the x-ray, uh, you may as well get both views so that you can certainly uh, rule these things out. And I would definitely get, uh, I mean, you might just need to get one, but if there's anything whatsoever in the history that doesn't make this a stereotypic classic case of croup, you should go ahead and get that lateral neck radiograph. Because if the patient does have epiglottitis, very mild epiglottitis, and you send the patient home, that patient is going to come back either dead or in serious condition. The treatment for croup once you've diagnosed it is going to be dexamethasone and nebulized racemic epinephrine, which is taken uh, in the hospital. Uh, and then you'll observe the patient for at least three hours after the epinephrine has been administered because it is possible that they could close back up. Um, however, after this, they typically can be discharged. So this is uh, an example of croup. So you don't really see a whole lot unusual here, but you do see this track here. This is your trachea, but notice how it thins up here. And this is the steeple sign. Also, they call it the pencil sign because it kind of looks like a pencil with a really long tip. So this is the steeple sign. So let's see, I got another one. Yeah, okay, so find me the pencil sign and the steeple sign. It is right here. Now, when we go on and talk about bacterial tracheitis, it's a lot different. You will have this steeple sign, but with bacterial tracheitis, you can a lot of times see some cloudy exudate uh, along the, uh, the trachea. Uh, and the clinical history will be a little bit different for bacterial tracheitis as well. So the differential for croup is, of course, any other causes of strider. You should consider uh, these if the patient is drooling and appears very ill. So in that case, we're considering the possibility of epiglottitis. Uh, you should also consider a differential if epinephrine nebulizers are ineffective at relieving symptoms, or of course, if anything in the history suggests other possibilities. So the one big one is spasmodic croup. And so up until now, we've been talking about just regular old viral croup. Spasmodic croup is a little bit differently um, in that it is similar to croup in that you get the barking cough and you get the strider, uh, but in uh, spasmodic croup, you may have a prodrome. 
uh, but it'll rarely have a fever, although croup doesn't always have a fever itself. So, uh, but the one thing that really will tear you apart from croup is that croup tends to respond to epinephrine nebulizers, spasmodic croup does not. So if the patient has a presumptive diagnosis of croup and you give them epinephrine nebulizer and they don't show any response, then you can consider spasmodic croup. Retropharyngeal abscess. So this uh, would show up uh, as drooling neck pain, of course, because you have an abscess. You can see this on radiograph. Peritonsillar abscess will give you a change in voice. Uh, neck pain, ear pain, that'll be usually that's usually referred from the abscess. Also halitosis, since this is right around your tonsils, uh, it's going to emit, emit whatever is rotting inside that, uh, in, inside that abscess, and that'll cause halitosis. Uh, since this is growing around the tonsils, it's gonna cause a, a deviation of the uvula. Unlike croup, this is not sudden, and again, the radiograph will help with your differential diagnosis. You'll be able to see the abscess. Angioedema, uh, this typically presents uh, quite differently from croup. So you have a swollen face, swollen lips, swollen feet, swollen hands. Uh, you can have hives. So it looks like some kind of an allergic process going on. And a lot of times patients will have a previous history of these kinds of episodes or a family history of these kinds of episodes. And in many cases, there's a known trigger. Epiglottitis, these patients come in looking very ill. They tend to be drooling. Um, that, not something that you see so much in croup. Uh, they also tend to be in this sniffing position where their their neck is sort of flexed and it's almost kind of bent over a little bit, leaning forward. And if you try to put yourself in that position, if you bend your neck, um, so just extending your neck and then um, leaning over like you're sniffing something, that's pretty much how they look. Um, and all of their, what they do, you just Google it, it's called the tripod position. I'm not sure if I included a... Uh, an image of it on here. I probably did on the uh, on the epiglottitis uh, slides, but uh, anyhow, that position is very characteristic for epiglottitis. Uh, and then the thumb sign on radiographs, you'll get a lateral radiograph of the neck, and you can easily find the uh, you can find the epiglottis. Uh, it's pretty easy to find because it's right posterior, basically to the uh, to the hyoid bone. So. Uh, in the epiglottitis section, I will show you what a normal epiglottis looks like compared to the thumb sign, swollen epiglottis, the epiglottitis. A foreign body, uh, usually there'll be a history of this, although the parent may not observe their child putting toys into their mouth and, and uh, inhaling them. Uh, but this will be a sudden onset, and you can have, again, things that look a lot like epiglottitis, drooling and respiratory distress. And anytime you see drooling and respiratory distress, boom, you're thinking epiglottitis. So if you don't have a history, then that's gonna be the first thing you think of. But one of the things that's going to help you differentiate this from epiglottitis is that there are no uh, systemic signs. These children are not going to have a fever. They just have something mechanically down there, sort of almost simulating an epiglottis, uh, or a swollen epiglottis, uh, that's causing their their strider and their respiratory distress and their drooling. Uh, and this, again, can be very easily seen on radiographs. Trauma can cause uh, can cause strider, and so you can differentiate that uh, from croup from your history. And then tracheomalacia, this is a congenital issue, so usually there'll be something on the patient's chart, but there's associated anomalies with tracheomalacia. Those include gastric reflux disease, cardiovascular defects, developmental defects, and tracheoesophageal fistula. Defects, developmental defects.